Are you a leader in customer success, pre-sales, professional services, support? Do you work behind the scenes and roll up your sleeves to make sure that customers are happy? Renew. Then this is for you. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Getting it done. Services, success, and software. We'll talk with the pros that have been in the trenches, getting service teams off the ground, launching new types of groups to service customers, or running agencies that don't have a product attached to it. For the pros, by the pros. This is the GSD Podcast, and this is your host, Jeff Kushmerick. Hey, this is Jeff. I hope you're having a good week when you're listening to this. Uh, here, it's uh, let's see, today is March 24th. Uh, it's starting to get a little warmer here in Boston. Uh, don't have to bundle up. Uh, so, hope uh, wherever you listen to it, it's 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 nice out there. Um, wanted to introduce the next podcast with John Kirkman. John, John's awesome. Um, just a quick note: we had a, a couple little technical glitches. I think his kids were like playing a, a massive game of, of uh, Minecraft uh, <laughs> or something, and they finally plugged into the router. But there may be one or two jump cuts where, where you hear me ask a question it doesn't get answered. Um, but uh, I, I, I sent it out to get smoothed over and processed. This interview actually happened a little while back. I, I want to even say maybe December or maybe January. And... Um, and uh, sent it out, got it all fixed and everything. So perhaps you might not have even noticed that, that there was an issue, but just in case, um, he was not ignoring me. <laughs> so, so John's awesome. Uh, he was introduced me from uh, George uh, Jaganinski, who was on the podcast uh, a few episodes back. And both these guys are just uh, dyed in the wool consultants. John was working on really complicated uh, supply chain management and logistics things uh, as a part of Deloitte's practice for, for many years. He was then hired by Nike to come in and, and take some of that experience. And uh, we talk about that. Uh, you know, a lot of us who have been in professional services, we get brought in to, you know, whip things up or, you know, you know, shape, shape the team up and things like that. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's not just making people work faster and, and do things like that. So we, we got into that subject. I, I do want to say, and I remember this happening in the while we were chatting, that we went over some niceties and some basic types of questions and everything. And then I feel when I was editing it right around maybe like the 20, 22 minute mark, the conversation turned and kind of just, it, it was really like we found something and we just were talking about it. And I just really liked the part of that interview, like moving forward. So, um, so that was great. Um, I hope you dig. If you're listening to this and you want to be on the podcast, just let me know. Uh, I got contacted by quite a few people recently, so I'm really excited to have people outside of my network. Um, but whether you're a leader or you've just been doing this two or three years, like I'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, just happy to, to talk shop and get it recorded because a lot of us are going through the same stuff. So um, lots of exciting stuff coming out. I, I've got like uh, two ones, one with somebody pretty big um, uh, next week. So uh, look forward to that one. But in the meantime, really enjoyed John here and I look forward to talking to him again. Thanks. All right. John Kirkman is with me here. Nice to meet you, John. Or not meet you. Yeah. Like nice to get you yeah. on the podcast. Catch up um, again. Yeah. 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 So interesting note on this. Um, for anybody that's a frequent listener, uh, George uh, Jaganinski was uh, on the podcast. And he loved it so much, and he basically said, "You got to talk to my buddy John." And and like <laughs> the the reverence that he spoke of you, like, is the same like <laughs> like like two of my buddies that might have backpacked through Thailand in their twenties, like that type of that type of reverence like that's yeah, a uh, george and i go back a long way it's been a yeah it's a fun journey with him just kind of you know working starting work with him and then you know kind of growing from there so it's uh we have 
both professional history and personal history. It's just, uh, yeah, a lot. I have a lot of reverence for that man as well. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's great. Um, and it's also like to my dream of when I started this, which is like, let's get some people outside of my direct network. Like George and yeah, I have yeah. done a ton of stuff together, but like, you know, we met through George and we haven't worked together, had a, a, a quick chat and we immediately hit it off and was like, oh, there's a, a bunch of things we can talk about. Um, yeah. So we're going to go through John's background at first, but what we're really going to be focusing on today um, is it's something I've seen so much of is people that have been consulting for a while and doing consulting and then being pulled into either startups or larger organizations, basically saying like, we need somebody with that consulting mindset to come in here and yeah. kind of, it's always shake things up, right? Or like, it's always, it's never like, yeah, I just want to come in here and have you do this job. Like, which, you know, we can get, we're going to get into because those are fixes and those can take years off your life and stuff like that. And I apologize. I tried to turn all my notes off, but uh, it's not going to happen, I guess. But uh, so let's get into it. John, uh, yeah, let, let's start post-college and how you sort of uh, you know, do the quick five minutes and of how you got to where you are. and, and some Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, happy to. Yeah, um, I'll try to make it kind of brief so we can get to the meat of the details. Yeah, um, went to school in the D.C. area and had an opportunity. I was focused on kind of uh, industrial engineering in school, uh, systems analysis and, and, and engineering. Um, and I really I, I love the idea of supply chain. I, and I gravitated towards it at an early age just because it's so metered in metrics. Right. So yeah. mathematically brained and all that stuff. It's just fun to kind of use the supply chain as an example of I did this on Tuesday. I, this is what happened next Tuesday. Right. Yeah. And so right out of work, worked with a company called Worldwide Retail Exchange, which yeah. is kind of um, before SaaS, you know, so software as a service was a thing that was that was in vogue at that of those days. Of these was that like dropship and stuff or was it like. Uh... No, no, it was, it was pure technology. Right. Oh, so okay, where. Cool. In the, in, the, in the parlance of that time, uh, Walmart was had invested heavily in retail links to connect their their distributors, and the, the whole network was kind of connected via retail link. And, and every yeah. other, you know, the targets of the world, Kmart's of the world, kind of said, "How do we do that?" And yeah. they got together and kind of co-funded this this initiative. And a bunch of grocers uh, joined as well. Oh, nice. But you know, I bounced around kind of that that space for a little bit of time. Uh, but I think you know, kind of jumping to the formative years uh, were, was really at Deloitte, uh, Deloitte Consulting, where gotcha. I joined as an experienced hire as a senior consultant uh, and then worked my way up through eight years up to a senior manager oh, nice. there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... Um, well, the good news on that is that you, you didn't have to have your own apartment, right? Because you just... <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. There was, um, there was several people on my team that uh, they just brought their suitcase with them and had a PO yeah. address, right? So it was... It's one of those where you could you could be everywhere, and, and 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 in fact, during recruiting stuff, I would tell people, don't go to New York as a BA or a consultant. Go live in Cleveland. You're getting paid yeah. the same amount of money. You're banking cash in your twenties, and you're not going to be home anyhow. <laughs> it's so true. And you know, I, I I I joke, but like so many people have gotten so much out of that that experience, and some yeah. of the people I learned from did that, and uh, it's it's a tremendously valuable if your life is set up to to have that sort yeah. of. Well, yeah, exactly. Could I do that again? I mean, I just got married uh, last year. So it's like, could I do that again? No, probably not. But, uh, yeah. you know, it was, it was, again, informative for me. Yeah. And, you know, in, in that space, I was still focused on supply chains. So our strategy and operations practice at Deloitte, uh, I sat in our kind of the intersection of supply chain and retail, mm -hmm. uh, kind of going through all that stuff as well. So it was, um, like I said, I have a bunch of leaders there that I still are, are and, and still very connected to. Yeah. Uh, one of my best friends on the planet uh, is a senior partner there now. Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of grew up through that, through that process. When, when you were doing that, were you working, uh, when I hear strategy, I, I always wonder how decoupled that is from like the developers and, you know, and that whole project team that is actually building software and everything. Do, do you mind just getting into that for a minute? Yeah, yeah, sure. And I think this is just structurally how Deloitte, and I, I know that it's changed over the years, but uh, how it was structured at that time is, you know, strategy and operations was, you know, we, we had different functions. We had a technology specific function. Uh, we had uh, kind of an, an entire SAP uh, focus, SAP implementation yep. focus, Oracle focus, et cetera. Um, so we partnered with them a lot, but we didn't have fingers on keys uh, to do any of that. And, and primarily like a lot of, you know, I think it's a lot of the ethereal stuff that your BCGs or kind of the others of the world get into yep. of like, um, you know, this is, this is what the strategy, the pie in the sky strategy. And I yeah. think at the time, uh, the CEO of, 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 of Deloitte had a, had a very, Profound phrase that stuck with me is executable strategy. Hey, so we had a quick little internet glitch as as it happens these days. So uh, <laughs> we all, we turned our videos off and uh, we're, we'll be chatting. Um, so, but John, you were talking about uh, you had just started to say executable strategy, and we're starting right. to explain that. Yeah, and so I think I was yeah, it was very formative for me, right? So in, in the 
in that space, it's not just about talking about the 10 year vision or, or this or that. It's really about what is a three year kind of horizon that we're looking at or five year horizon. And then let's go help you do it. Yeah. And I think that's, it was different, you know, having done interviews at that time in a number of different places, it was different to me in the sense of, um, Hey, we're actually going to, we're actually gonna make this real, right? It can't just be a pie in the sky vision. It's gotta be kind of thoroughly thought out and kind of that we can go do with you such that, you know, it's, it shows the value. Um, and I think that was demonstrable for me in terms of like how Deloitte was approaching that at the time taught me how to approach project, how to approach kind of just career wise, like what is the value and, and then stop thinking about the, you know, the crazy, awesome vision. Let's, let's start talking about like the crazy, awesome now. Um, That's so important. And I, I think and kind of goes to some of the context for today's chat, which is in the professional services world, you just have to keep showing value. If you're not showing value, <laughs> I see you later. We're going to bring you yeah, back. Yeah. It's a, it's a constant scorecard. Right. And, and there's, I, I think for me, it's, 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 I need that in my career. I need, I need that kind of aspect of a measure kind of what I'm doing. So I, I'm never going to just punch a punch, a, you know, punch a card and collect my check. It's really kind of, uh, you know, day to day, you've got to pay the rent kind of deal. Uh, yeah. and, and you got to do the work. You got to kind of show up and, and kind of do the work. So I think that for me is, was super formative. Uh, and, and certainly I took a lot, a lot away from that. That's great. And so where, where'd you uh, switch over to next after? Uh, eight yeah. Um, so I was there for about seven or eight years and then moved on to as uh, actually moved to Europe. Actually, my buddy had a technology startup over there that was focused on supply chain, um, transportation management and kind of inventory management optimization. And so um, the call I kind of had with him was around this idea that uh, uh, great company, we have a software, we think uh, there's products that we can kind of manage out of this. How do we scale this how do we create an implementation team how do we create a consulting team how do we create how do we go through the inflection point of we have a startup technology to it we have a gestated kind of great technology afterward right and that mm -hmm. has platform that has modules and all that stuff so a bunch of you know really fascinatingly smart folks uh we, we had partnerships with eindhoven university for a lot of industrial engineering stuff and it was just really kind of cutting edge um you know because i think in the, in the time that we're in uh, there's a lot of transportation management softwares out there. If you can extend, if you can look at the entire ecosystem of a supply chain, you can really start to dissect and say, and so uh, customer support, uh, customer implementations, uh, that sort of thing is, is kind of where I fell. That's great. Again, very formative, very, very awesome for me to do that. Uh, spend about a year, year and a half there, uh, and then got a call from Nike to, you know, come do strategy for them as well. So from Europe, moved here to Portland, Oregon, and, and focused a lot uh, with Nike, focusing a lot on kind of the supply chain technology space. So thinking through, um, you know, the transition from wholesale to retail, it can be quite complex. And when you, when you build your entire environment uh, for a wholesaler, uh, as a wholesaler, rather, you, um, even just kind of the technology processes are, are different, right? So how we think about full truckloads as opposed to an each, right? So thinking about a pair of shoes as opposed to truckload of shoes, you know, not only it's just from an operational point of view, but actually from an execution of, of the technology that support that, uh, vastly different. Um, so a lot of fun problems to solve there. I was on that role. I also did marketplace operations strategy for them. Did you ever get into the um, like the last mile problem or any of that stuff? Uh, at the same time, kind of at, during my, the end of my tenure at Nike, I was uh, very much involved with, we have here in Portland, something called Portland Incubator Experiment. Okay. Um, and so uh, here at, 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 at Pi, uh, there's a lot of this sort of basic liaison or kind of part-time um, mentors for these startups. How do, how do these startups think about creating a business? How do they kind of do all that and, 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 and all that jazz? And, so I got involved uh, through a friend of a friend uh, with a venture fund here that owned Homeschool Outerwear, which is um, a brand, a snowboard, uh, an outerwear brand. Yep. Uh, to help kind of just kind of consult and kind of come in and say, hey, how do we, how should we think about inventory differently? How do we reposition ourselves in the marketplace, um, you know, in, in kind of sideways times? And so, you know, I've been doing that uh, for a little while and um, yeah, I've just been kind of side consultant doing digital transformation along with George, as a matter of fact. Oh, okay. Um, around that area as well. I, I didn't realize he was on that project too. Um, no, no, I, I, different, I mean, I, I, different spheres, right? So homeschool was kind of my project. And then uh, there's a couple of clients that I had just you know, leaned in on a little bit with George uh, uh, on some you. of the stuff that he was doing. So, yep. Yep. yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's kind of, that's how I got to now. Yeah. So it's, uh, that's still here in Portland, Oregon. It's beautiful, <laughs> as rainy as it is. <laughs> when we're all out outside. Yeah, exactly. You're right. <laughs> and so what are the types of things you're doing now? Yeah, I'm doing a lot of uh, like consulting around just kind of this digital transformation. I think COVID, um, you know, I think that that phrase gets lost. And I think I, you know, yeah. watching, I'm not going to relive uh, the conversation with George, but I think with a lot of companies now, the, the stark understanding of what what being digital means, um, 
is transformative. I mean, it's a, a, not to belabor the, the, the word, but it's it's one of those moments where people kind of talked about it as the wrecking ball was hitting the building kind of deal. Yeah. So, um, and I think I think the ball has crashed through the, the wall and people are saying, oh, we actually do need to pay attention to that. So a lot of the, the work that I'm doing are for kind of the mid-tier brands and kind of local brands here of like really understanding how to embrace that, how to be digitally native as they start, particularly with some of these startups. Yep. Uh, and I think those people have, a, have an advantage. And then setting up kind of the structure and organization around that. Uh, and then, you know, kind of working still of, of ideas of like, you know, George and I have this, these ideas around behaviors that persist. So how do you create an environment where remote is, is the new norm? Because it is, right? And how do you kind of embrace and grow that uh, yeah. effective across the And I know we were chatting about that a little before we joined on, but like, you know, it was never my preference for a remote team uh, beforehand. And now we're all remote. We're, or everybody's yeah. remote unless, you know, they're on the front line or something like that or some other people. Um, which we could probably, I know we're going to, we could actually just keep spending a bunch of time on that. Like for, for me, I always had this philosophy that was you're, you earn being remote. Like yes. you, know, you might've been in the home office and then it's like, Hey, my wife's family wants to move out here. I want to be an X, Y, and Z. And now there's not that choice. Have you been helping people out with that or, or sort of just in this whole remote and digital aspect of stuff? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's a question that continues to percolate up is, is just how do we, you know, succinctly, how do we embrace the remote environment? Um, because I think there's, there's this transition that's happening in the workforce, right? You've got what I would call, you know, not to, I'm not trying to castigate anyone, but kind of the old guard of like butts and seats matter. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, and, and having, and maybe this speaks to the point of like being in consulting. My last year of consulting, I spent 256,000 miles in the air. I spent oh. 330 nights in a hotel, <laughs> right? So I was on uh, four different projects across the country managing remote teams. And, and as we talked about, you earn your rent every day in, in consulting. Uh, and so I, you know, I kind of grew up that way. Uh, and, but it's, you know, you get to a corporate environment where people just expect butts and seats. It's, it's a little bit different there. So that, that transition is tough for a lot of folks. And, and the how, you know, a lot of things that I took for granted from a consulting perspective, the how you do that is super important. And then how you embrace the kind of the ethos of the environment or, or create the ethos of the team. Uh, super important and relevant for that. Actually, on that subject, can we peel uh, uh, back to um, to the Nike conversation? Because I know we sure. had like a glitch and stuff like that too. Like, w did you feel that you were an anomaly coming in with a consultant background and you're dealing with lots of people who had just been like, I've been here 10 years and, and that stuff. And like, were you brought yeah. in as sort of I, like I think doing the change agent thing? I'm and, not trying to be uh, diplomatic about this, but yeah. I think there there is that. Yep. Nope. I hear you again. You back? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm now connected, moving directly to the the Wi-Fi point as well. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I, I think it, it's Nike. Every time we want to talk about Nike, <laughs> <laughs> seems to be the case. So, um, but, um, so, but your question, your your question is related to you know, did I experience kind of the um, you know, kind of some angst? I would say the, the, uh, the change agent brush back. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and again, you know, Nike's only been around since 1972. So thinking that through, of like, folks are still there that have been there from the beginning. Yeah, uh, and you know, th there's just a massive transition they're going through. You know, being a wholesaler is one thing; having to deal with you know, big sporting goods or kind of the uh, foot lockers of the world. You know, it, it's you know, it's one thing to do that to to, to talk and manage direct to consumer. I mean, that's a whole different world, right? And and so part you know, part of that that transition, kind of you know, bringing me on board was around how do we think about that change and how do we effectively manage that change? Yeah, it's, uh, it's that, I think it's sometimes, and you know, we're trying to be diplomatic about it, but that mindset of earning your dollar and yeah. we can be replaced easily. <laughs> I'm only laughing because I think you and I keep getting pulled into these situations. Like we want that consulting there, like fire in the, you know, fire in the veins and, you know, people kind of lose that. Like I will say, you know, it's one of my stories and I, I won't say which company or what it was, is that, you know, we, a lot of companies had moved to agile in two week sprints and things like that. Right. And uh, I was brought in and the issue was developers, if they weren't <laughs> such a contrast, if the, let's just say project team, cause it involves QA and PMs and everything as well too. But like if the pro the product team was not, um, delivering all of the features that they had signed up for a sprint. And it was like, Oh, we'll just roll it into the next one. Right. And, <laughs> and, uh, and that was like, and there were eight sprint teams 
and they were all doing different stuff and couldn't be measured. And, and part of the conversation was around that, which was like, well, it's, it's not the tool and it's not the person, it's the mentality around what is failure and what is success and what are the expectations yeah. of something like, I get it. Right. Like you missed a story in a sprint if that happens to everybody, but to accept it and just kind of like hand wave it off and go play some ping pong. I like, I just don't remember that happening um, from, you know, the consulting days. It was like, no, we got to get this done. And unfortunately that might be a very long Red Bull field um, yeah. scenario. Yeah but that's sort of what we were brought up through. And it's kind of like, this would be an interesting point to keep going on. Like, Oh, the dog's barking. So I'm going to go into <laughs> me and go off to you. But like, since you've been there, you don't want to be in that scenario. So you plan. So you don't get into the 20 hour Red Bull fuel days. Yeah. And it's, it's funny too. Like there's, there's, there's an aspect of, yeah, trying try to think through again diplomatic a bit better. But there's also an aspect of companies hiring consultants and saying, "Hey, we need." You know, I joke about this sometimes. We need uh, you know, ten years of experience in consulting, ten years of experience uh, in industry, and ten years of experience doing X, Y, Z things. Uh, and then once you get to that company, those thirty years of experience don't matter anymore. No. So now you need to assimilate. And it's like I think it's to what you're saying. It's like the, the the fire. We want that fervor. We want that fire. Go get them kind of attitude. But once you get here, we want you to just assimilate and be like everyone else. And it's like. There's, there's a, also a push and pull and take on that as well. And I think it's also, you know, especially the larger the corporation, it's, it's harder to find the ones that really kind of accentuate, I guess, the consulting skill sets uh, such that they can empower change as opposed to be, you know, because I think a lot of folks view consultants, particularly strategy consultants, coming in and saying, you know, kind of the seagull manager, come in, squawk a bunch of times, leave yeah. crap everywhere and kind of fly away. And so, so I think there, there's also an aspect of like, as you think about the industry, as you think about these corporate uh, environments, ha they want this, this kind, of, that, that kind of train of thought, but they have, they're gun shy on the amount of change that may need to happen. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, how do you embrace that? How do you take advantage of that and kind of you know, grow that uh, side of an organization through that change? Yeah, and probably the toughest part of that, and, and I, I try not to do this because I'm not the best at it, is, is the, George was talking about this, like people want the new tool, right? Like, oh, we're going to put yeah. this new platform in. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's not really going to fix your problems. Uh, are you still bumping into those scenarios today for these companies that are, and we don't have to mention anybody, but like for the, that are kind of in this new digital transformation or, or transformation because they absolutely must, are they, are you still dealing with these? Like, well, what if we just, you know, got everybody on this platform and it's like, uh, yeah, well, there's, a, there's an adage I learned at, at Deloitte that uh, I think is pertinent here in that a fool with a tool is still just a fool, right? <laughs> um, so <laughs> when you think about implementing the next shiny tool, it doesn't solve the problem. It gives you, I, I joke that it's a, a, a tool with a crummy process or crummy business behind it. It's only going to make that bad process happen faster. It's not going to fix the process. It's not going to change the process. Yeah. It's going to make it happen faster. And so that could be good. It could be bad, but don't expect a tool to be that one you know, silver bullet or linchpin that's going to change the world. Yeah. It, yeah. To your, to your question. I mean, it's, yeah. All the time <laughs> people say, Oh, we just need, it's, it's the next shiny thing. Let's go get that. I know. And, and then you just, it says you start pulling these things apart. It's systematic and there's just, it, it's, it's a hard gig, man. It's, it's like, you've got to change like 50 to a hundred people's way of viewing things. And there's, <laughs> You know, it's like dealing with like a divorced couple and they have all this baggage and, oh, man, it's, that, it's just, like, just, the transformation stuff's hard. It's hard work. I don't it do it, it anymore. Um, I'll try and fix a point problem, but, uh, you know, that it's, it's, it's a tough gig, so God bless. <laughs> yeah. it's, and, and, and I think, you know, speaking about Nike in particular, there, I think from a strategy point of view, their strategy group is full of a lot of strategy consultants, and rightfully so. I think there's a, you know, that, that, that pursuit is noble in that um, you want to think about from a brand perspective, you want to think long-term or kind of this kind of high in the sky vision and kind of create muses around that to kind of trickle down to the brand itself. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, kind of the, the actuation of the brand rather. And I think that's su super, super relevant. I think where it becomes tricky is when you land, when you think you need a consultant uh, mindset to come in to just, like I said, assimilate uh, is where I think it becomes a bit dodgy. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, even in my past, I, you know, I, got the feedback, uh, you know, again, not going into details, but got the feedback in industry of like, 
oh, John's great. He's really, really smart. Whip bang smart. He just is very consulted minded. And it's like, yeah, well, that's, that's what you're hiring, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of that, that catch 22. Uh, but where I found like, you know, thinking about what I'm doing now and kind of the, the experience I've had here importantly, like the consultant skill set, I think translates, I can translate very well to corporate environments. I'm not to say to disparage that, but mm-hmm. I think in the startup world, holy cow, is that, is the skill set of being a consultant particularly powerful, right? You, you think mm-hmm. about um, managing ambiguity or kind of, um, you know, being jack of all trades, master of none, knowing when to be six, six inches deep versus six feet deep, right? It's, it's helping organizations that are going through a startup or a kind of entrepreneurial phase to think about these things in broader terms and help mm-hmm. them understand how to kind of part, you know, piecemeal this together. So it's not, you know, we're full of sales oh. today, you know, eating the elephant all at once, right? So how do you, kind of like just, it was just dealing with that on a, on a call right before this one where I was like, Okay, you want to throw that MVP out there. Uh, okay, cool. Did you guys, by the way, think of like privacy policies and then user license agreements? And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> like you're sending this out to enterprise users and they're going to need to like sign on and create an account and be sh-. And like, oh, really? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then like you feel the bad guy for like, you know. <laughs> for pooing the parade, right? <laughs> oh my God, exactly. But, you know, n- not to... You know, because I know we can get into all the, the crappy stuff and everything. But like, you know, one of those other benefits I can think of, and you just touched on it with the managing ambiguity. Is, or I, I, I don't know, you focus a lot on supply chain, but maybe post supply chain world. It's also like being able to context switch, right? Because essentially, yeah. it's always the same problem. It's like, it's all that we just yeah. talked about. But it's yeah. like, like, uh, you know, being able to walk in and say, what do you guys do? Like, oh, you do X, Y, and Z. How do you feel or do you have any sort of things that kind of glare out at you? Is, is that like, because you said you were working on four customers at one time. Like, I definitely know that drill. Um, <laughs> were, were they all sort of different verticals or were you, did, were you stuck in one vertical and you just kind of were seeing the same problems over and over again? Well, I think, yeah, for, from a, from a you know, consulting years, I think the the reason – there's like rubrics and kind of baked things at, you know, templates, if you were, mm-hmm. if it were at, at the consulting is you oftentimes see the same problem percolate again and again and again. I think um, in particular, my experience at Deloitte is, is we had industry and then we had kind of a focus, right? So it was like industry and sector mm-hmm. uh, of like what, what you're actually doing, right? So I was the cross section of retail and, and um, supply chain. And so, you know, thinking about that, it's a, uh, yeah, I typically saw similar problems across those environments. Yep. Uh, but it's when, you know, the beauty of the consulting too is you can be sideways to that. So I did a lot of sourcing procurement projects as well, um, which you wouldn't think is supply chain oriented, but very much is. And so, you know, it's, but the, but the, but the approach becomes a metered measured approach. Um, we, with great certainty, can say, hey, we can save money in this category, for instance, or we can optimize inventory flow in this way uh, or kind of do these things, right? And I think, you know, oftentimes consultants get criticized because, well, you, you've done this before, so just give us the blueprint and be on your way. And it's like, well, it, it's not just about the repeatability of a problem or, or a solution to a problem, rather. It's about how do you integrate that with the current environment. So you can balance, you can see the same exact problem from one customer or kind of client to another. Um, but it's how you solve it, it you know, it's, it's fundamentally different. How you deal with the organization, how you think about the organization is completely different. So. 100% agree with you on that. There's, there's certain people I work with and, and sometimes you try and go, like, yeah, we're just going to do X, Y, and thing. like, yeah, we're not going to do that. I'm like, okay, um, let me think of a different way around. So you got to be able to get outside that template. And, yeah. 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 And, and, and the consultants that typically fail are the ones that rely on the template, right? It's right. like, oh, we've solved this problem before here. Go do this. Yeah. And that, just that, just even thinking about that is like, just go do this. Well, they hired a consultant to come help do that, right? It's, it's not just the doing of that. It's the, how do we create the journey across that? Again, going back to our value conversation, how do you create value with using you know, a solution to problem you've already solved? Well, the value becomes of like understanding the environment and why this hasn't been solved before. Because if there's, you know, if there's all these templates out there and kind of approaches and, and rubrics to making decisions, of course, people are going to have some latency to, to adopt that, but why, why wouldn't it change? It's because I think a lot of the organization structure, right, a lot of the, the power of, I guess, the superpower of consultants is really understanding how to layer that solution in with and kind of integrate it with, with the environment it's in, with the organization's in, because the complexity of those are just, they're vast. So something totally to the side, but like I was hearing um, what you were just saying, and I'm like, now, like in the remote world, because we know what this would be like if we were in person, we'd be you know, walking the halls and having the big conversations and doing the sticky notes and the whiteboard drawings and things like that. 
because uh, th th this is some of the work that I think is is difficult to do remote. Like it's kind of there's a reason why Accenture and Deloitte and everybody else was successful with the in person models and everything's because you kind of need to be there to have those conversations and work through these issues. And we didn't talk about this beforehand or anything, but I'm curious, like, what tools are you using to kind of convey these problems and your solutions? Like, just to help you out, like, I occasionally use Miro now, which is like a whiteboarding tool and stuff. Yep. Like, I'm curious, like, in this new remote world, how, how you're kind of addressing some of these, because these are big problems um, and they're hard to fix. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things I took away from consulting and kind of thinking that through was, is if there's always a presentation, right? If there's, there's a deck on this and I'm going to spend the evening creating a, a deck of slides and, and do this and do that. And I think there's certainly power and a place for that. Um, but I think where we're in now is, is you can't just call people together in a meeting, go through a deck and say, Hey, do you guys understand? Yeah. I think to your point about using apps that have whiteboarding that allow people to kind of collaborate back and forth is, is really transforming how I guess consultants would engage clients, but also, mm -hmm how clients engage themselves, right? And, and yep. thinking that through. So for me, it's it's the same thing. So the Miro app and, and there's, um, I use a lot of Slack, right? So Slack for me is so much better than email because I get to sign up and kind of not sign up for for the feeds, right? And, and yep. really kind of collaborate on that. So that that's a platform of choice for me as well. Um, but also, you know, Zoom has some great technologies and I think you know, a lot of these uh, meeting stuff are starting to emerge as, as powerful and, and way to capture stuff in a meeting and then send it out afterward is, is kind of where the power of, the, of those come into play. You know, it's, it's like setting up the meeting when you go to any, any you know, client's uh, site. You got to make sure the technology works. You got to make sure there's a projector, you know, but like all that types of stuff. Uh, um, like, now, well, George, you gotta, probably, I told George, right. you gotta make sure you get the M&M &M cookies too. Like, <laughs> but now it's about making sure that, you know, it's translating what you would typically think about a meeting space into requirements for software. Uh, and some of those things you might have taken for granted before, but that becomes kind of software requirements. And that's how I've been kind of evaluating those, those types of sessions before. Um, yeah, yeah and, and, and don't get me wrong. It's not to say that I'm not, not using PowerPoint and others to kind of send decks across, but it's just, I think the collaborative nature of what, what the, the scope of work that I'm doing uh, requires you to be a little bit more um, intimate and interactive with, with, the, with the clients. Yeah, and it, it is, it's that interactivity that yeah. like, hey, let's just go grab 15 minutes or grab a coffee and talk about this problem or, or how are we going to get through this and being able to grab people quickly and like, hey, let's just whiteboard this out or whatever or just talk to people and now it's like you got to schedule a meeting but everybody's booked because there's zoom yeah and yeah long and all these things and it's it's, it's also the, the the proclivity to kind of have you know what i call death by a thousand paper cuts with 30 minute meetings all day is like yeah. all right when can i carve out space because for me how my mind works is i, I need to carve out time for myself of, to, to do just whiteboarding stuff for myself right and yeah. thinking about like how do i organize this and how do i catch that and and that, I think, was easy to do when you sit in an office in a corporate environment. You just shut the door and say, hey, I'm busy and working on the whiteboard yep. stuff. Yep. Uh, but people look at your calendar as, well, they're available. They're readily available, so I'll just schedule a meeting. Or if they see something, you know, it, it just becomes a calendar jockeying exercise. Yeah. Uh, where I think it's just tougher and tougher to kind of get that, that self-time to kind of whiteboard yourself or kind of, you know, randomly grab some. Because that's inspiration is not planned, right? It's kind of just. <laughs> It appears sometimes. Yeah, that so, whole like, hey, do you got a second? Like, hey, I just yeah. Thought, like, oh, yeah. a little, you know, like, there's none of that anymore, right? Like, occasionally, right? Like, and then it's like, okay, let's fire up a quick, you know, Slack, Slack meeting or something like that. But like, uh, uh, so on that note, I mean, I'm sure this is not some new hack or anything, but like blocking those, putting those blocks on your calendar is like, do not disturb, which still happen, right? Like, that's why we have to reschedule this. <laughs> but like, yeah, um, no, exactly. But like, you, you know, I will go and drop like a three hour block um, in my calendar. So just nobody can touch it. So if somebody does grab one hour, I still have like two, but it's hard, yeah. right? Like I, I that was just walking with my wife, we were walking the dog on a quick break and said, I think I need to carve out some time this weekend to actually like, write the user stories and something like, like when do I have time to like do that, you know, do all the interviews, compile all the stuff together. And now it's like, crap, now I actually have to write, like, you know, <laughs> do that because I'm doing some product management for somebody right now. Like do yeah. actually write the user stories and do all that stuff and explain to the devs and get so that, you know, for me, I never want developers, um, you know, gathering requirements when they could be coding and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah. when am I going to do that? Like, when do I have time to, because you know, like, you know, I'm sorry, I'm like going off on a tangent here, but like, no, no, no. I, if I have, like, if a meeting ends and I've got 15 minutes before the next meeting, I'm not going to like, oh, let's go super in depth on some user require. Like, it just doesn't happen that way. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah your brain. Yeah, I, I, I haven't found a person that can just turn on their brain like that and just jump into that and get a little yeah. piece of the work done and then move on to something else. Uh, um, I think we as humans are geared around kind of finishing or kind of being in, in, entrenched in something and moving on to the next thing after we're we're doing through that process. <laughs> you just reminded me, and I hadn't thought about this for years. But back when I was a developer and uh, this guy Troy, I think has he been on? No, he, uh, but a good friend of mine. We worked at a couple different places. We were both developers and we were writing custom solutions for our, you know, somebody would sell our software and then we would customize it a little bit for them. And then, you know, our boss, eh, not, you know, hard, hard guy to work with. Definitely, you know, I know now he was pushing for high quality, but he'd be like, hey, I really need you to, to get this thing done before the day. And then we'd look at our clock and we'd be like, hey, that's a 17 minute task and it's 4.45. So unfortunately that would go into tomorrow. So, so <laughs> I'm going to do <laughs> Yes, yeah. It's funny too, because you know, the other aspect of, of the remote ask, you know, remote working and COVID and kind of all that jazz is I, what I find is a lot of people schedule meetings to just show that they're working. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, no, I, I believe you. <laughs> I, I, and in consulting, I had the kind of jargon of like, I measure output, not input. So I, I want to see the quality of the work at the end of the day. If it takes you 20 hours, if it takes you 40 hours, you know, if it takes you 60 to 70, 80, we got to have a conversation, but yeah. I measure output, not input. And so what I find oftentimes now is happening, not just with me, but a lot of my friends, my wife as well is a lot of meetings just show up to say, Hey, I'm, I'm doing the work. And it's like, yeah, we all are. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you're doing that. <laughs> I don't need a 30 minute meeting to kind of talk about that. I know. Let's see what it's done. <laughs> like meetings, like I try, you know, I'll schedule them super, early, you know, 20 minute meetings instead of 30 minute, like, you know, 50, you know, yeah. 10 instead of 15. Like I, I'm always trying to just cut them down. So everybody will be on point and interesting. Cause we both have kids. I will tell you when I made that switch, cause I was at a startup and, and an amazing startup by the way, but there was a dinner culture there, which was essentially in yeah. CEOs brilliant on this. Basically like, like I'm going to get, I'm going to get really nice crepes for dinner or really nice this or that. I just gave away. I'm hoping you do. <laughs> like, um, and everybody was like, yeah, he's like, but I'm not going to order them till six 30. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> which was great for the people. Like we were all no kids and you know, stuff like that. Um, and it built this culture of like, Hey, we're going to really stretch this work day out for me. So that worked, that was fun and definitely, you know, was um, like kind of career making, you know, yep. time for me and everything. But then I had kids and then I was like, hey, I actually can get a lot done in 40 hours. And I was like, I wasn't bullshitting. I wasn't doing any of the yeah. side yeah. It was like literally like I need to crank. And then that's kind of when I, you know, the GSD started getting known as like getting shit done. And it was really like, yep. I just don't have the time. I don't have like this time anymore. I need to be able to be super efficient in the stuff that I do. And, and I actually feel I have lost a lot of that with COVID for exactly a lot of the stuff that we've talked about. So, yeah. And it's it, what we used to do in consulting as well to kind of mediate or kind of not mediate, but measure um, ineffective meetings is you also just put out a billing report and saying, okay, you guys won in the meeting. We had seven consultants there. You had <laughs> 14 people from your side there from our side. This is how much that meeting cost. Yep. Did, did we achieve the objective that we wanted in that meeting? Or no, we continue to have these types of meetings. And, you know, and, and I see this problem persist in a lot of different areas where, you know, even in Nike to some degree, it was like have the meetings before the meeting so you can get the meeting alignment in the meeting that you already got in the oh, meeting before. Oh, my God. And you add oh, up the cost of that. Oh it's just God. like, you know, it, it, it shows you right in your face of like, holy cow, that's an expensive decision that should have been done over uh, oh. a, a GF fun session. Just get shit done and, and decide and go. I, you know, it's trying not to say my favorite thing, so I won't say it, but like, uh, <laughs> Isn't it interesting that uh, <laughs> I, I I started saying like this is a five thousand dollar meeting in in some of these startups I would go to and they're looking at me like I've got ten heads and I'm looking around I'm like guys if you broke our salaries up like we're all like billing two hundred dollars <laughs> or something like that like or whatever yeah. it is winds up being there's fifteen of us in here we have a two hour long exec staff every every week and then we will have further on conversations and it's like just you two people need to talk figure yeah. it out, get it done. Like, you know, forget about, you know, Oh my God, we're going to just unravel so much stuff here, but like, you know, not everybody needs to be part of the conversation. Like it's okay for two people to go off and make a decision. Now like, we don't have to be super democratic and everything. So. Yeah. It's there's, I, I'm not disparaging in consensus building at all. And I think that's important as particularly in a corporate environment, building that consensus. But um, when it becomes so belabored uh, that consensus wherever, Everyone sees consensus as I have a decision right as well. 
Yeah. Um, and, and so that becomes a very bureaucratic and if everyone has a decision right, then no one has a decision right. And so what, what I found I effective laughed, in that. I, I just laughed because I, I realized what wound up happening here through this tangential conversation is we actually started showing the consulting mindset as it applies to some of these things, right? Because yeah. you and I have this like, like, like people would always get pissed off at me. Like, I'm going to go back into my work. Like, you guys go f around and do whatever yeah. you got to do. Talk amongst like, yourselves. <laughs> yeah. So let me know when I need to be brought back into this conversation. And you can kind of do that now. And like, on, like I'm just going on mute on Zoom. And like, somebody ping me when you need me to come back in and, you know, put my mind. Yeah, on. it's, it, you know, it's even prior to COVID that happened as well with, with leaders that were in, in meetings. And, and one of the tools or tricks that I've learned from consulting uh, to manage the meeting size and because typically the larger the meeting, the more spin um, or whether the spin happens in the meeting or outside the meeting. And so one of the tricks of the trade that from, from a consulting perspective is as people want to join a meeting, you ask just, just the blunt question. So, so what is your role in this meeting? Well, yeah. I just want to listen in. Well, I'll send you the notes after that. You know, it's kind of that, that just that obtuse uh, because again, the more the people are in the meeting, the less work that actually gets done in that meeting yeah. to decide. Like, why, why, like and, wait, why is finance here? Like what, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, what, what role? And it's, you know, it's, it, again, it sounds obtuse, but I think it's, again, especially in our time where everyone's, in this time where everyone's kind of just hair on fire, I've, I, I've got to be a part-time teacher, I've got to do the work, I've got to do all these things. It's, it's super important to kind of manage the time correctly. And, and that simple trick can help, you know, dispel uh, this, these large meetings, kind of, you know, fragment those meetings into the meetings that matter the most. Yeah. And it, it all dials back to the consulting this is a two thousand dollar meeting, or we need to show value, and it's like y you have these things that built into your mind, and it's sort of like, yeah. guys, let's get this stuff done. And I, I swear to God, um, yeah, I, no, I, we can go off all day on these types <laughs> of things, but I think it's really just showing where 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 some of the skill set can be brought in to really streamline and and make sure that organizations can be just super effective. Yeah. Uh, you like let yeah, just people go do what they need to go do. Um, and right. right. And, and, and the other thing too is, is typically as a strategy consultant, you're bringing in from, from an executive. So just the power of being able to, as a consultant to say, okay, um, you know, if, if you reach a, a, a deadlock in the meeting or discussion, yeah. uh, the card that, you know, the ultimate card that I can always play is like, okay, well, the CEO wants us to go do this. So I'll, I, what do I need to tell him? So what, what is it? Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, no, we don't have to tell the CEO. It's okay. So then, so I think that's a skill set that I haven't yet found how to translate that to the corporate world because everyone in the corporate world is, is on that team, right? So they all have some reporting structure up to that. But that was, it's an interesting card to play as, as a consultant because you're just like, hey, let's short through the bullshit. All right, I got to go tell the CEO something. What do you want me to say? I'm not, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. We, we, we've, we've, we've lost track of the set or the, the opportunity here. So what, what do I need to tell the CEO? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so and how quickly people jump in line after that is, is amazing. Yeah, the the amount of like this shit again memes I pulled up and yeah, like is uh, <laughs> what's well, a lot. Of, I mean, frankly, it's it's a lot of posturing, right? So yeah. you know, and I, I, have, I have empathy for that too. Like, you know, in a corporate world, you know, you got these consultants coming in, thinking they run the show, and that's not that's not the mindset I ever had. But I, I can I can appreciate that some people are, have been burnt in the past on that. Yeah. What I don't stand for, what I don't I don't enjoy at all, is people that just throw up firewalls or box. Just to just to throw up a wall, no, for no other reason than to say I can throw up a wall. Um, that's very frustrating. My guess here, and, and you'd probably know this better than I, is that you know it's always a pendulum swing. It happened once, so somebody said I'm going to make sure I'm in that meeting the next time, and then suddenly, like, that's the culture, and everybody's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just looked at the time, and we, <laughs> so we had I haven't over. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, oh my god, two twenty-two. I'm like, oh my god. So um, let's let's do this because I, I, I we should probably get one with you, me, and George to go through some more stuff here. But like, let's. I think this is probably a nice break point. Like, I'm going to ask you sort of what's the big initiative that you're trying to like, you know, finish off the year with or your big focus for right now, and then we'll uh, we'll close it down and we'll we'll come back in and, and chat again at another time. Yeah. So. Uh... Yeah, it's you know, we're, we're two weeks out from Christmas, and, and typically organizations start to shut down now. Yeah, um, some of the stuff that I'm working on is, is still around holiday, so I'm still in kind of the retail space. So yeah, I'm thinking yeah. through kind of just the high level consulting with with some of these retail partners and startups is is how do you deliver on on what you have got consumers to buy, yeah. uh, and how do you think through that stuff? And I think you know again from an operation from a supply chain point of view, it's it's much easier in that role to say, okay, this is just what needs to happen. These are the things that we just go, need to go do. It's, it's there's yeah. not 
we don't have time to burn. Uh, right. So there's a, a burning platform for that. Uh, but setting up next year and kind of going through what's post COVID looks like for a lot of organizations. Yeah. Um, and then, and then as, as George and I kind of talk about a lot is like what behaviors persist beyond COVID and kind of starting to map that out. Mm. Um, that's more for, for me, uh, yeah. kind of thinking through as you think about digital transformations, like what are those behaviors that can persist, uh, that help kind of disrupt, uh, how we think about talent, how do we think about building teams, all that, all that jazz as well. Yeah, I've it's heard some really because I'm working on a in a video project, but it like basically how to make Zoom not suck as much and stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> and, and you hear when we start talking to the different user profiles, like all the cool stuff uh, like that HR is doing now with like interview rooms and you know making sure that you know that all these things that would would have been done in person to make people feel like they're joining a fun organization or not a boring organization. Uh, you know, or how to make sales meetings better or how to do X, Y, and Z, you know, and this, it is th these forced transformations that have happened. And then it's like, okay, well, do we just go back to, uh, back to interviews or, or, oh, so are we going to go back to that thing where you show up for six hours and get drilled yeah. by 10 people now? Or are we going to yeah. actually, so th that is a interesting point. I hadn't even thought about that. So yeah, it's, yeah, and it's funny too. Like I was thinking through just from a Deloitte is we had a telepresence where the end of the, the conference room table would have a video screen on the other side. It just looked like the table went on. Well, that's step one. That's basically creating a corporate environment, you know, within a corporate environment. But now that's, that's been blown up to say, how do I create every individual uh, seat around that table so that we're all connected in that way? It's, yeah, it's a di yeah. different way of thinking. Yeah, it's great. So listen, John, just hang on for a quick second. I'm going to start sure. the recording. This is awesome. Um, we went super deep in a couple of areas and just really enjoyed how that conversation. <laughs> yeah, super fun. I love talking As most has brought through what we were trying to figure out from it. But, <laughs> uh, thanks again. I'll, I'll stick your LinkedIn uh, and where people can find you and all that fun stuff. And just hold Appreciate on. Appreciate it. Uh, awesome.